pleasure uh, to be here tonight in Venice um, and to be with Mimi, who I have found so many people who follow me on Instagram and get to have this dose of Mimi's magical life from Venice. You have many admirers, Mimi. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this. It was actually really great to, to come here just a little bit uh, before seven to see Mimi preparing for her dinner party and to see how she's setting the table and lighting the candles, like this kind of amazing ritual that you have uh, here on a daily basis, really, because um, Mimi's beautiful home is kind of this beautiful cultural salon. Okay. And you welcome people from around the world when they come to Venice. So Absolutely. And so many people do. So many people pass through Venice that it's lovely to be able to give them a glimpse of what it's like to live here. Um, because, you know, no, not everybody gets to see that. So when I have someone that contacts me, I like to invite them over for a drink or for dinner or for lunch or whatever. So I've, I've always done that wherever I've lived, actually. So Maybe. I like to share. <laughs> Mimi, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, tell us, so you're from New Zealand originally. Yes, I'm from New Zealand. I was born and brought up in New Zealand. And I left, um, uh, when I was 21, I went to Sydney. And then I worked on board a ship coming to England. In fact, I went around the world three times as children's hostess, when people still took ships between Australia and New Zealand to the UK. And um, I... Um, I came to Venice, um, well, I worked in London for a long time, uh, and then I married, and I came to Italy, actually first to live in Tuscany, um, outside of Cortona. We had a farm there where we lived um, for the first couple of years of our marriage, and uh, I loved it. Um, it's a beautiful part of the world. It's very, very special there, too. Like everywhere in Italy, uh, there's... There's so many magical places. From there, we went to live in Paris, where both my children were born at the American Hospital in Paris. And uh, I briefly went back to London, where I did up a couple of apartments and sold one. And then we moved to Southern California, to Newport Beach. My husband's entrepreneurial, so uh, we moved around quite a lot. And uh, then I found myself back in England and uh, eventually back in Italy. Uh, my husband bought a bankrupt company in uh, a place called Schio, north of Vicenza in the Veneto, and um, we lived there for a number of years, and then we moved here to Venice nearly 20 years ago, it's hard to believe, and uh, I was lucky enough to find something on the Grand Canal, because I, at the time I didn't really know anybody in Venice, uh, and I thought, well, if I don't know anyone in Venice, at least I'll be able to see the world go by if I live on the Grand Canal. And uh, the girl that was showing me places uh, said, very difficult, not many things come up on the Grand Canal. And then by luck, or perhaps it was meant to happen, perhaps it was my destiny, we found this place. And, um, and, and we've been here ever since. So you were looking for a place on the Grand Canal. Well, I, I did look at other places, but I decided that perhaps, as I didn't know anyone here, that it would be nice to live on the Grand Canal, where at least I saw the world go by on the Grand Canal uh, until I had time to make friends and, and meet people. Actually, we can hear the canal, the life on the, the boats passing by, which is absolutely amazing. So maybe how is it to wake up every morning and see Venice wake up? It's amazing. It's, uh, I never really take it for granted. Um, there's always something happening. And you get very used to the noises. You know when you start to hear the delivery boats sort of about six o'clock in the morning going up the canal. Uh, and, uh, you know, any time of year, it's magical. You, uh, now this time of year, you start to get fog. In fact, the other morning when I woke up early, I couldn't see the other side of the canal. Uh, it was completely covered in fog. Uh, often you get a sea fog that rolls in because we are really out to sea. We sit on an island in a lagoon. A lot of people who come to Venice don't realize the size of the lagoon. And, um, and we have quite different weather to the mainland. You often see 
it very black on the mainland, which I can see from my balcony. And then I'll watch it go north around the lagoon. And sometimes I'll see it from the back of my place in the southern part of the lagoon, but it doesn't always hit Venice. And then of course, in the summer, it's magical. We sleep with all our windows open, and our doors, we've got uh, four sets of French doors onto the balcony on the Grand Canal. I don't even bother to shut them at night. And um, in the summer, and I wake up and I love the light in the morning in the summer. And um, I often sit on the balcony at night to hear the bell in San Marco, which is a larder bell that rings at midnight, just to hear it before I go to bed, um, if I'm up late, because it's, it's the, the bell that would finish the 12 hour cycle in the Arsenale when they were boat building here. And it's got a completely different sound. It's quite haunting. And I hear it very well from, from my place, although I'm quite a long way down the Grand Canal. And so your um, life kind of goes with the rhythm of Venice. I like it to go with the rhythm of Venice, with the rhythm of the water, of the tides that change every 12 hours. And, um, and, and the life, the seasons here. You know, now it's autumn. We're in the market. We're buying um, fungi, mushrooms. Um, squash, pumpkins, chestnuts, things that you, we eat very seasonally here. Um, perhaps in the winter we eat more meat than in the summer, not that I'm a big meat eater, but um, uh, this morning I bought two roast chickens for dinner tonight and um, we're going to have uh, cafe longue, which is a, is a starter, which is, it, it's like a worm that comes out of a shell uh, it's uh, caught in the lagoon and it's um, absolutely delicious. Uh, they all, in season, everything here is seasonal. In season, they serve it at Antica Carampani, which is a fish restaurant that's not very far from where I live and where we often go to eat if we go out. But we eat at home a lot. And uh, so we have roast chicken uh, with vegetables and followed by apple strudel that was made this afternoon. Uh, I'm one lucky girl. <laughs> <laughs> but then on on um, on uh, Monday or Tuesday I'll make osabuka, which I also bought in the market this morning. So Mimi, uh, tell us how it was to be here during the quarantine. Well, I wasn't here for the whole of the quarantine. Um, I was in um, New Zealand uh, when New Zealand shut down in March of uh, last year, 2020, for my nephew's wedding. Uh, who's also my godson. And I had been in Venice the week before with, with my grandson and I took him back to London and I got on a plane to New Zealand. And I knew at the time that there was this pandemic had started in Italy, but I had no idea that it was going to take over the world quite so quickly. And uh, I went out to New Zealand to the wedding and shortly after the wedding I was with my sisters I'm, I'm one of five girls in my family I'm the eldest and we went down to the South Island to Wanaka for a holiday and it was announced that very quickly that the borders were closing and so I didn't have a chance to get out along with thousands of other people who were stuck in New Zealand in my case I was very lucky because I had my sister to stay with and um, I was there for six months I then managed to get a a flight through to Australia where I waited 10 hours in the airport in Sydney. I wasn't allowed to enter Australia, although I have a lot of friends in Sydney because I've lived there different stages of my life. And then I got on a plane to Rome. My son picked me up in Rome and we came straight here to Venice and I, I didn't want to leave again. I said, now I'm home. That's fine. I'll stay here for a while. But um, by that stage, Italy had opened up, it was the summer, it was August, it, towards the end of August, and uh, my son was here with his two children and uh, his wife, and we had a lovely time. People were wearing masks, they were wary, there was, um, there was uh, perhaps not as many people around as normal, and then uh, come, come later on, there was a semi-lockdown here. And then was, there was also, um, uh, there, there, there was a, um, an evening uh, uh, quarantine, what do you call it? But um, a curfew. A curfew in the evening. 
and we were supposed to have only six people uh, in our house if we had people for dinner. So then the restaurants weren't open, but the market was still open. So I would, two or three times a week, I'd have friends over for dinner. But always come 20 to 10, everybody would suddenly look at their watches, and rush to get their coats and off they'd go. And um, we managed to get through the winter quite well, entertaining ourselves. Probably during the quarantine, I think what surprised me the most when I came to Venice last July is to see how empty the city is. And actually, the few residents that are left in Venice. I mean, most of the windows along the Grand Canal are dark and not open. So yes. I always love to imagine the city in sometimes in 1520 or 1560, where Venice actually had 160,000 people that lived here. And to think about how that number is really coming, becoming smaller and smaller every uh, year. Mimi, how many changes did you see in the city? You have been living here for 20 years. How did Venice change? Yes, I have seen quite a few changes, really. Um, even in the fish market, there are far less people selling fish than there were when I came here nearly 20 years ago. And obviously, I've seen people that lived here that have passed. Uh, one of my favorite restaurants, the Madonna the Treasury of Madonna, the father was there when I first came. Uh, no, I, I know the son who's the owner, and we eat there quite often. And um, in fact, I took Judy there for lunch with her daughter, Michelle, uh, when they stayed on a couple of extra days in Venice after the ladies had all left from the trip. And um, yes, there are shops that aren't there anymore, vegetable shops. Uh, we used to have a bakery very close to where we live, uh, where they did a delicious ciabatta bread, which we bought daily. Uh, now I have to walk uh, because I've found a very good bakery uh, in San Toma, Campo San Toma. So I have to walk there every day, but it's, it's good for me. <laughs> to, 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 I, I walk a lot in the city. I easily walk 10,000 steps a day and sometimes as much as 20. Uh, this is a city where you walk. You either go by boat or you walk. And you have a boat parked downstairs. We do. We have a Boston whaler. And we love to go out in the lagoon. And uh, during the summer, we go out and we catch our own vongole. Yeah. And uh, we have a sailboat as well, um, which we sail in the summer. And there hasn't always been on this side. And we're on the Adriatic side. But my husband sailed around the summer and we had a lot of fun with our grandchildren doing day trip. Mimi, how difficult it was to make friends or how easy it was for you? Um, yeah, I almost sort of forget how I first started to meet people when I came here. It was, it, it was slow. It was a slow process. Um, but I met somebody and then I was introduced to someone else and so on and so on started to invite people over for dinner. I had a lot of dinner. I had a lot of dinners <laughs> until I sort of found a, a sort of convivial bunch of friends um, that, that now one or two of them are no longer here. Uh, they've left for various reasons, but um, I, I do, I have some lovely friends here and a mixture of, I'd say, Venetians and Italians, yes. Mimi, yes. last time when we met, you told me that many of your uh, friends are considering to actually move to Venice. Yes, I've been very fortunate. And, uh, one or two friends that I've known for many years have decided, having stayed with me in Venice, they've seen how I live here and they have decided to come and live here and they've managed to find places. And, uh, and so that's very exciting to have them here. What do, you, what do you think is the most challenging part about living here and how hard it is to actually upkeep the palazzo? The challenging thing about living here is really moving stuff around. Um, so I have, a, I, have a, I have a trolley, I have a basket a lot, with wheels uh, to go to the market. But coming from the car, which I keep here in Piazza di Roma, there are some garages and uh, I have my car parked on one of the garages. 
I have a very nice porter that I will call, especially if we've been skiing or something like that, where we have a lot of luggage. Uh, I will call him and he will come. And I think actually on my Instagram, I have a photo of him bringing some chairs and that I had bought him a fair in Palma and the lady delivered them to me uh, in Piazza di Roma. And I had my porter come with his trolley. But the porters here have these trolleys that have small wheels in the front and big, uh, big long trolleys and they can walk them and bigger wheels. They can walk them over the bridges, sort of, they actually sort of move them bit by bit over the bridges so they don't move anything around very much that they're laden on top of the trolley, which are quite long, a bit like a stretcher. And, um, and you'll see porters every day going around Venice. Uh, they haven't got much patience. They're always calling out. They want everyone to get out of their way. They're always in a hurry. Uh, anyway, I have a very nice porter. So that has helped. So I can ring him when I'm coming back into Venice and give him sort of estimated time of arrival. And he'll come and meet me at the garage and bring things in for me. We also have the boat. Uh, this morning, my husband came to the market and picked us up because we had, as it's a long holiday and we have people staying, I have my nephew and, and his fiance staying and my grandson. Um, and so everything's closed on the 1st of November being All Souls Day here. It's the day in Venice when everyone will go to the, to San Michele, the island where the cemetery is and uh, most people will take flowers there to their deceased loved ones and um, it's a very busy day uh, very crowded uh, the Vaporetta is going to the cemetery um, and it's a public holiday here so everything is shut usually on, on, on the 1st of November. Mimi, how do you think Venice changed your life? If you were living in another, somewhere else, and you could have probably chosen any city in the world. Well, we had to be here because of where my husband's business was at the time. How has it changed me? Um, I feel extremely lucky to live here. Uh, it's a privilege to live here, really. It is a privilege. And I think every day, I, I feel it's a privilege to live here. It, we live in a, within a museum. It's a living museum. Um, and uh, I don't take any of it for granted, really. Uh, during the lockdown, going back into the time when people couldn't visit Venice, what was wonderful was that I walked a lot in Venice and I saw a lot of things I hadn't seen before because when you have the crowd of Cales, it's very difficult to be looking up at the buildings. Um, but during the lockdown or the semi-lockdown here, when people weren't able to come into Venice really, um, I was able to see things I'd never seen before because I wasn't dodging people or, or porters or uh, being really, I could, I could take Venice in a very in a, a leisurely way. And, uh, and so I tended to walk all over in the different parts of Venice that perhaps I wouldn't normally go. And I love to walk on a full moon here. I love to just, when it's a full moon, just go for a long walk around Venice. Um, Mimi, and how about living in the palace? Uh, is that how hard it is to keep up everything? The floors, <laughs> even just the, the floors are a work of art, right? The terrazzo, ven ter terrazzo Veneziano. Exactly. In fact, when I uh, had this group of uh, ladies here, um, we went to see uh, Stefano and where his, um, laboratory is for them to have some idea of what it is to have uh, to make these floors because these floors are very fragile they have to be flexible because the palazzos are built on water and under the water is uh, many many millions of they deforested the mainland in order to build Venice so there are the wood there are wood piles under the palaces which petrify when they go into the mud and sand. And from there they built uh, with um, non-porous marble from Ischia, uh, not uh, from Isch Istria. Istria. <laughs> they, built, um, they built these uh, palaces, but they are very flexible and therefore the walls and the floor, well, the floors rather have to be uh, flexible too. So the way that they, they make them, uh, they often need repairing. Uh, they can be very fragile. 
uh, especially if you have children playing football, like I seem to have with my grandchildren here quite often, or riding bikes, because we have a long gallery. It's, uh, it's uh, an ideal place for children to have fun and play. So yes, I've just had the floors restored. Uh, it's most probably the second time I've had to have the floors restored since I've been here professionally. And then they're highly polished uh, with wax. And, um, and, and also the palace, uh, the floors are not even. We lean into Katron next door, which is, this palace is 15th century and next door is 16th century. And we tend to lean into the 16th century. So the guest room actually is downhill when you go into that room. A friend of mine, when her mother was staying here, she felt quite giddy every time she went into the, the guest bedroom. Mimi, what do you think? Um, the wear and tear, just palazzo by palazzo, this has been affected so in a horrible way, especially now with the global warming. Um, how it is to be here during the Aqua Alta? Do you go out or do you actually, are you forced to stay in the home? No, we go out, we will have Wellington boots to wear. Actually, I have waders as well. I have two pairs of waders for when it's really high. Although we hope it's not going to be high anymore because we have now the Moses, which is going to um, be put up uh, in Venice in a high tide. And um, uh, before we had the Moses working, which has only been in the last year, uh, we had a terrible flood in November uh, of 2019. And our palazzo, the ground floor was completely flooded uh and up some of the stairs and um it went all the way from the grand canal through to the garden on, and we have a lovely patio garden on the other side and um it was like a tsunami and i'm sure that many of you have seen the pictures of that horrendous november and a lot of things haven't recovered from that um but normally when there's just high high highish Aqua Alta, um, and we know always I have it on my phone, I know when it's going to be very high. We go out in Wellington boots and life for the Venetians carries on uh, even when there is high water. You may have seen also that there are um, boards to walk on that they have around the city during the high water. Uh, and a lot of people have these um, aluminium stocks that they put up uh, for their front doors, that keep most of the water up depending how high it is, the, the night of the November 2019, that didn't help at all because the water was so high. It was um, one of the highest it's ever been. I think in the 60s, it was slightly higher, but it was much below. So Mimi, between the people who are leaving the city because the, job, the jobs are limited, what you can actually do in Florence to make a living, the problems of Aqua Alta, at least until now, um, what do you think will be the future of the city and I mean, what we can do? Actually, actually, one of the things I've noticed is there's been a baby boom. When I first came here, our campo had, didn't have many children in it. Now it's completely full of children. In fact, Jack, my grandson, has been playing there this afternoon. Football, I was there briefly with him. Um, it's a very safe city for children and a lot of young people are coming to Venice. It's not all bad. A lot of young people are coming to Venice to live with young children because it is such a safe city and it is a wonderful way of bringing them up because they have a lot of independence here. Um, I've never heard of a child being drowned in, grand, in any of the canals. And my grandson can go to the camp on a day, is on, on his own at age 10 to play football with his friends, which is not many places that you can, you can do things like that. So hopefully there will be enough of new citizens of Venice. Really. There are a lot of new citizens. The schools are now full. Uh, it's quite hard to get into some of the schools here. Yes. Uh, I think there's a, a great future for Venice. Uh, it, it will carry on. It's difficult with when there are a lot of tourists here. Um, I think a lot of tourists forget that people live here. They think it's perhaps a Disneyland, which of course it's not. It's a living city, uh, lived in by many people. Uh, who love the city very much, Venetians and people who have chosen to become a Venetian, like me, a Venetian by choice, let's say. 
Um, yeah, so you will remain optimistic. I'm optimistic about the future of Venice. I have a very good friend who works in a museum uh, here in the city, and she said one lady asked her, at what time does Venice close? So she thought she's actually asking about the museum, Palazzo Ducale, saying, oh, you know, we, we're open tomorrow. And she said, but when is the city? When is the city closed? So she literally thought it was like a Disneyland where you get a ticket. And, and they're actually talking about establishing a ticket to get in the, down, in, the, in the central area. Do you think that will happen? I think it's very difficult to control that. Yeah, um, I can't quite see how that's going to happen. I know there's been a lot of talk about that. And yes, there are days when really there are just too many people here. Yes. And it's very unpleasant when you can't, or you see children that can't get on the evaporator to come home from school because the evaporators are full and things like that, or can't get to school, um, or to appointments, or mothers with push chairs uh, that aren't able to get on. I've seen that recently. Um, but Sorry, what was the question again? I forgot. The question, so you're, yeah. you're even optimistic about the city, that the city will live on and... Uh... I think it has to organize itself perhaps in a better way. Um, and the city will definitely live on, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a living city and it will continue to be that way. Nimi, what are some of the uh, non-profit organizations close to your heart? Because what is one thing about Venice is that there's so many people like all of us actually gathered here uh, today that really love the city and its art and uh, the restorations that continuously happen uh, in all the churches and museums of Venice. Many of them are thanks to... Well, thanks a lot to Tocha Bergamo. Tocha Bergamo Rossi. Yes, he's a good friend of mine and he is an amazing person. He gets things done here. And it's not easy because Italy has a lot of bureaucracy involved. But Toto is an amazing person at being able to get things done. And he has done wonderful things for the city. And his latest project is Cadoro, which is very close to me, that he's working on. He finished Palazzo Gramani and it's a wonderful museum. It wasn't often visited before. It's well worth seeing. And I took all the ladies to see it uh, when they were here. And there are artisans working here. I hope that uh, that will continue to have uh, that kind of an input of, with artisans uh, working here in studios. Uh, I took some of the ladies to see some of the artisans. And uh, not only did we see the floors that were um, how they made the floors, but we went to see boats that are built for, for Venetian residents. Um, by Franco and Giudecca and, um, and many other artisans while they were here on, on their trip, uh, of which I'm going to do many more trips uh, in the future uh, because it was such a success. It was my first. And, uh, so uh, apart from um, Toto Bergamo Rossi, who uh, is the director of Venetian Heritage, and he was a guest, um, actually at li exactly a year ago, Toto was a guest in Paolo Studiolo, Many of you got to meet him and get Toto's books. Um, for you, what are the places that, uh, as we think of the travel to Venice, maybe three of your favorite spots that no one should miss? You love the market, you love the Rialto. The Rialto market is wonderful. Um, perhaps not on a Monday. A Monday that is, they don't fish on Sunday, so there's no fish on the Monday. But anytime from Tuesday through to Saturday, it's well worth a visit. But just if you go there, remember there are people trying to shop <laughs> for their weekly or daily food. And, uh, and sometimes I think people aren't very thoughtful about that, uh, that are wandering around. But it's well worth visiting. And then I think for everybody who comes here, uh, it's quite important to understand how the city evolved. I think visiting the Doge's Palace is, is a must. You can either get uh, a guided tour or you can have the earphones and walk around. Uh, I think that's very important. Well, San Marco is a wonderful point of reference, but there are many other parts to Venice too. There's this wonderful lagoon out there. If you take a Vaporetto and you go to Verano or Torcello or uh, Murano, where the glass is made, 
um, you see a little bit of the lagoon. There are also boats available. I, I took the ladies for lunch uh, on a boat with Mara, the most wonderful lunch. It's an old fishing boat. Unfortunately, it was blowing Bora that day, which is the wind that comes from the north straight off the mountain. And uh, so <laughs> they were all very brave and didn't complain, but we did find a nice sheltered spot to actually stop when we had lunch. But I wanted them to experience the lagoon. It's so beautiful with so many different birds and wildlife there that uh, it's well worth a visit also outside of Venice and to, 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 to go into the lagoon. The South Lagoon has still not mm, been repaired all the walls from because uh, when the storm of November 2019, all the walls came down in the South Lagoon on, around the, the, the gardens and that. And so if you go south, you still see quite a lot of damage. So, so much to see, but starting with Rialto in the city for sure. Rialto. Rialto, very important. Yes, San Marco. Uh, Rialto really was the center of the world when was. back when Venice got started its all the banking golden happened, era. Yeah. Exactly. All the fonts that she are around as well. So different communities would have a chance to actually have their own headquarters. You know, very close to here is the Museum of Natural History. Yes which used to be actually a Turkish or Ottoman Empire, uh, their headquarters in the city. And then close to reality is also the German Hondako. Exactly. So truly fascinating. Um, but um, what I wanted to, I know and that- And I think, I think an evening ride down the Grand Canal is also a lovely thing to do. Yeah. When the lights are on in the palazzo, so you can see, yes. you can see a little bit. Yes, you can. One of the that's quite magical. True. And Toto's book, uh, Inside Venice, uh, the introduction to the book was actually written by James Ivory, who came to Venice as a very young man. And he, this is how he actually became a movie director, because he decided to do for his uh, thesis at university, instead of writing it, he wanted to make a film and he made it in Academia Museum, uh, the, the circle of uh, Sant'Ursula paintings. And uh, James Avery wrote how he was a young man looking out of a foretto, looking at the, on the canal, looking at the palazzi and trying to imagine the conversations of people standing on the balconies. And then he came many decades later as already celebrated director. And he said one day they actually had the, rented the palazzo on the Grand Canal. And he said, all of a sudden life kind of makes a big, big turnaround. And he was the one beautifully dressed on the Grand Canal with a glass of Prosecco in his hand. And I think it's such a beautiful um, a story, something to dream of. And, and actually Mimi many times used this hashtag, Mimi's magical uh, life. Yes. So what is the secret? Can you tell us how can we, well, James, whatever we are. James Ivory actually has been here to dinner. With wow, Toto. I had no idea. Yes, I met him, he came to dinner. A lovely man. Lovely, amazing person. And, uh, the, the Mimi's Magical World, <laughs> Stephen Moore, who uh, is a friend of mine who's on the Antique Roadshow in England, his speciality is porcelain. He also does webinars. I listened to his webinar on Friday, was talking about dinner, actually, about how dinner came about, the, the, the actual uh, word dinner. And um, he, he was the one who said to me one time, it's Mimi's magical world. And I thought, he's so right. So I've been using that as a hashtag ever since. I think he was staying with me, or he was here for dinner. And it, it came, maybe we were standing on the Grand Canal. So how do we create a magical life, Mimi? We, maybe not everyone can live on the Grand Canal and live in the Palazzo, but what do you think is the essence of that magic? I think always having a lovely table, surrounding yourself with candles, if you live in the country, perhaps a big open fire that you light. Uh, I think you just can create your own magic. Why not? True. We have this one life. Yes. So we have to make it beautiful. I love beautiful things. I love being in beautiful places. I love Italy. Um, your project um, is at home in Venice. That's yes. another hashtag you actually use it quite a bit. Tell us about at home in Venice. A lot of people ask me about my tables because I love to set a beautiful table. 
And um, from there, I've, um, I'm developing at home in Venice, which is going to have, for the moment anyway, just Italian craftsmen, candlesticks, um, ceramics, uh, many things for the table, and beautiful cushions, uh, lampshades, lamps, things along that line, uh, beautiful covered boxes. Just trying to think what else I have. I have my nephew here to help photograph this weekend some of the things that will be on the website. Of course, glass. I will make sure coming to, from Murano. I'll make sure to share that as well. As uh, I send a recording for today, I will share that account on Instagram as Thank well. Um, so the magical life, we, we all have to create it. Work we on have it. to create it ourselves. Yes, yes. Mimi, you have been very gracious with your time. Okay. I'm sure there's many, many questions coming in. Um, maybe let's see, I, I have prepared so many things that I wanted to ask you. Maybe let me just consult my notes one more time and just see. Um, let's see, your future plans. How about, um, you're, you're mentioning the trips that you want to do? Yes. So I had 12 ladies here, which is a, a, a good number, a nice number. And we did six days in Venice and two days in Aslo, which is a beautiful hilltop town, because I wanted the ladies not only to experience the lagoon, but also to experience the Veneto or a little bit, to see a little bit of the Veneto. And so we went to stay in the Cipriani in Aslo and we had lunch in a wonderful villa on the Sunday and we took them to Bassano to see the Palladio's Bridge and we went to visit uh, the Canova Museum, which is near Asilo, and also to another beautiful Palladian villa called Mazere. And we stopped on our way at Malcontenta, on the foot of the, um, the mouth rather, of the uh, Brenta River into the lagoon, which is another one of Palladio's beautiful creations. And, uh, and to see the countryside. And I think everyone felt sad leaving Venice, but they loved Aslo. They loved the area around there. And we stopped also at the Brion uh, tomb, which was done by Carlos Scarpa, which is well worth visiting there, Aslo. So altogether, uh, I think this trip uh, is a lovely way of introducing people to, to, to Venice and, and the countryside around us. Because of course, the Venetians also went out and built these houses in the countryside from Venice and farmed. And uh, so it's, 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 it's still the connection with Venice. Yes, yes. You know, Mimi, I think one of the secrets to creating magic uh, is curiosity. I I'm see very you, I see <laughs> that curiosity because we had a chance to walk together to the Rialto market. It was the Artigianato day yes. where the, all the artisans were actually uh, gathered there and I saw Mimi's curiosity uh, meeting everyone looking at what they had and how they produce it I think that is probably what keeps you inspired what keeps you learning and meeting new people as well right yes and also I love to go out in the countryside in the car and so many beautiful little towns around this, this area that you know to go and visit and have something unique about them yes yes um I think there is so many questions coming in, um, but what I wanted to do, Mimi, I actually have something for you. And as oh. I look at the questions, I, I would like you to have this, a little oh, gift from you. Florence, because Florence, after all, is a home. Uh, so if you want to open that, please do. Thank you. Just kind of as a little memento, because all of our, all of my guests in Studio are always sometimes miles away. And to do this in person is truly an honor and a privilege. So I wanted to have a little tangible memory of our time together. Oh, thank you, Paula. Let me look at the questions here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's see. So Karen is asking, how often do you go out by boat? And I'm always, Curious, what people eat for breakfast 
if you're comfortable sharing. What's it interesting? Oh, Isn't it interesting? Oh, look at that. So much. See, I don't know if, you, if maybe bring it a little bit closer in. It's a Florentine. It's a Florin. Florin. Let me let me do it. Can yeah. I? Uh, so the Florentines pr started producing their Florin with the Fleur de Lis. Uh, so one side is Fleur de Lis, the other side is Saint John the Baptist, the patron saint of Florence. And this was actually the coin that uh, they would be trading uh, in for about 300 years uh, from 1500s or actually late 1400s all the way to 1700s. It was made of pure gold. Uh, so it never lost its value. So it's literally, it was kind of a Euro of our days today. So they have a saying in Florence, one Florin today or thousand Florins tomorrow. So maybe that is my, that is my wish for you. you. Thank you very much, Paula. That's lovely. I'll treasure that. So, Karen's question, how often do you go out by boat? And also she wants to know what do you eat for breakfast? <laughs> how often I go out on but which boat? The sailing boat or the or the Boston whaler? Karen, I, are you with us? Um, let's well, see. how often do I go on the Boston whaler? Maybe every day. It's the way it, it's the way you get a Venetian gets around Venice is 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 by boat. How hard it is to actually um get a license to operate the boats uh, under a certain horsepower you can go without a license ah okay yes. yes and we are under that horsepower okay it gets quite busy especially on the grand canal it, it, you're not allowed under the rialto bridge till 12 o'clock or the bridge by the station ah until 12 o'clock noon yes residents are not allowed Okay, so there are some rules. Yes, but I mean, we can go out on one of the side canals. We can cross here and go out another way if we want to go out uh, into the lagoon or if we want to go to our sailing boat, Okay, which is on one of the islands. And how about what do you eat for breakfast? Oh, what do I personally eat yes. for breakfast? Fresh fruit from the market. At the moment, I'm eating pomegranates um, with yogurt. And I always start with the coffee. And fresh orange juice. Often I have a coffee early. I wake up at six or seven. I'll go to the kitchen and get a cappuccino, and and then I'll have breakfast after eight. On, on the whole. Susie, so that king. Uh, did you raise your children in Venice? No, they went to school in England. Um, because we came to Venice, they were they were really more university age. But I raised my grandson for eight years here in Venice, and he went to school every day by boat. So he speaks perfect Italian. He has forgotten. He has forgotten. He's. I'm giving him lessons again. Every morning at eight thirty, he has a teacher coming to the house here to to pick his Italian up because he wasn't here during lockdown for that year, and he he was in England and he forgot his Italian. I mean, it's there somewhere. He hasn't totally forgotten. It's coming back. He's speaking it again. Uh, the question is, did you speak Italian before you moved to beautiful Venice? No, and I'm not very good at it. My husband, luckily, is fluent because he's always worked in, in Italy. So uh, when you say the city should be better organized, can you suggest how? Well, there are many ways. For a starter, there should be a lot more rubbish bins here. Rubbish bin, uh huh. Rubbish bins, mm -hmm. rubbish bins. How do they put the rubbish in? Actually, how do you collect the, the garbage? Do you have okay. to bring it down? No, they ring our doorbell in the morning and they call Spach, Spachino, uh -huh. and uh, they and we open the door and they come in and we have a place downstairs where we keep our rubbish, and they just pick it up. And there are certain days when you have uh, plastics and glass and paper, and. Um, but just for the amount of tourists who come in, there are not enough rubbish bins around Venice. Uh, but the rubbish is empty um, every day, except Sunday. And they have a great big um, rubbish boat that will come to one of the, our one is at St. Stai, where they'll come, um, they hand carry all the rubbish in great big stainless steel bins on wheels, uh, which is then hooked up on a hook and dropped into the boat and the bottoms open up and all the rubbish goes down onto the boat and um 
Maybe imagine how that would have been back in the uh, Renaissance. How did they deal with all of the, you know, 150,000 people living in the city? Imagine just the daily running of this place like that. How do you think they had so much rubbish? I think we have a lot more, unfortunately. We have cultivated a, a throwaway society. Yes, true. Yes. Um, the question is, do you use your rooftop roof terrace? Do you have a roof terrace? No, we don't have a roof terrace. Many of my friends do, and yes, they do use them. They're very hot in the summer, unless they have um, a kind of canopy over them. I have a balcony because I'm on the first floor. And what is called the Piano Noble, and um, and I have a balcony which is lovely, and we have the garden down below. We have a, a lovely courtyard where we can eat, and then we have table and chairs. In summer, we can eat out there, we can take everybody everything downstairs. But I think you can never really be bored living uh, on the Grand Canal because all you need to do is just open your doors and sit on the terrace, and the whole world goes by, right? Often I think they wave at me. I think they think I'm Minnie Mouse, and they're in <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> Mimi, what was the strangest thing you saw from the from from your balcony? Oh, I've seen a lot of strange things from my balcony. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything particular. But I mean, I have. I, yes, I once saw a wooden car. Well, in the, obviously, it was a boat underneath going down the Grand Canal. So it was but I mean, I see weddings, I see funerals, I see deliveries, I see the post, DHL, the police, the ambulances. There's never a moment when there's not something happening on the Grand Canal. Yes. And really nothing can be kept secret in Venice, right? I mean, you oh, always yes. have your neighbors who see people coming in and out. That is, I think, why the Carnivale became such a big deal here, is because you at least could disguise yourself as something else for a few months at a time. Yes. Um, uh, Patricia is asking, that is great. Are these only available online or is there a shop in Venice? I guess she is referring to uh, at, at home, home in Venice. Venice. Yeah, this will be a website soon. The website coming out made and, and we're doing the photographs this weekend. Uh, question we'll is, what is, what is a great place to have dinner in Venice if we go to visit for two days? That depends on your budget. Yeah. Um, Give us something. I, to, I took the ladies to Quadre one night, which they all loved. Quadre, Quadre oh. in, in San, Marco. San Marco. Okay. Actually, they had a private visit to uh, San Marco, and what I'd wanted to, into the basilica at 9 30 at night. And what I'd wanted to do was to take them to dinner first, and then we go in there. But we couldn't get the nights together when Quadre was open and when we could go into the basilica. So we went another night and they absolutely loved Quadre. If you're here for two days, I suggest that you go to the Madonna, Treasure Red, Madonna and Rialto. Perhaps you take a walk on uh, in uh, Canareggio on uh, Misericordia, uh, Fondamenta Misericordia, where you'll find many restaurants, but also places to eat cicchetti, which is uh, something that uh, is eaten a lot in Venice uh, in the early part of the evening on bread, either fish or meat or vegetables uh, or on a piece of polenta. My favorite is Teria, the Al Oscuero, ah, the yes? Chiquetti, please do you love it. Yes. Al Oscuero, oh, it is on San Trovaso. Yes, San Trovaso, yes. just across the one of the last golden gondola building uh, schools. So yes. it's a fun place. No, that's visit. a very, that's a good place to stop. Or a glass of wine and a bit of chicchetti. Uh, question, do you dress your table with flowers? And if so, what are your favorites? Well, that depends on the time of year. I love roses. Uh, roses are beautiful. Um, it really depends on the time of year as to what I, what I can find. Um, so you live very seasonal life, like everyone else. We eat seasonally does. And, we, and our flowers are, are seasonal. Can I tell you how many very times? Little import. Very, very little Very little is imported into Italy. It's very self-sustainable yes. as, as a country. And yes. I think it's something that a lot of people should look to. True. And many times I'm still the, you know, the the fact that I'm not Italian comes up when I actually go to the market and I ask them, 
I asked a few days ago for a spanagy, the asparagus. Oh no. And he looked at me and said, what do you mean? This is still too early. So anyway, I will be very, very careful to even ask the question, you know, because then you could have showed that you are not local. No, no. Um, we have a wonderful asparagus season here. With yes. White asparagus that's grown in the Veneto. But Coming up in April, about May. Okay. Okay. Um, Laura is saying thank you for sharing your favorite places in Venice. I will be in Venice in two weeks for my honeymoon and we'll make sure to visit them. Oh, wonderful. Lauren, you enjoy it. Uh, Sabine, let's say, Sabine is saying, um, Mimi, are you thinking about organizing uh, these kind of events uh, more often to have people uh, enjoy this Italian uh, flavor of life? Yes. Yes, we are. Yes, let's see. Um, one of the ladies is saying, would love to see an example of your table settings. Susie, all you have to do is follow me on Instagram and you yeah. will get that. Um, Sophie is saying, Mimi is living Bella Figura life. And that is one of the events I had was with the writer Camille Mohammadi, who write, wrote the book Bella Figura, ah. which we talk about, you know, just surrounding yourself with the beauty. Um, it's not only Bella Figura of looking good and elegant, but just living that wonderful life. So I think that is a secret to many happy days. Um, Susie's asking, how I always get lost in Venice. Do you, did you find it difficult to navigate the small alleys? Yes, and how long did it take you to actually get to know the city? <laughs> I walked. I just walked and memorized. And actually, I don't know the names of lots of the places. I only know how to get there by the church, or the shop, or something significant. Um, Karen is asking, are, you, uh, are they boat parades on the Grand Canal? Oh, yes. So many. So many. What is your favorite festa on the canal? I think that uh, the regatta that they have on the first Sunday in September is always great fun. Yes, yes. That is perhaps uh, one of my favorite. But there are, I mean, this morning there was a small regatta. They were all dressed in Halloween costumes. And I just happened to go out on the balcony with my nephew and his fiance. And I said, look, look, they're all passing. They're all dressed up. They were rowing. Wow. You know, I got to experience the Venetian life on the Grand Canal when I was at the Guggenheim 21 years ago. Yes. I was on the intern for the Guggenheim and Peggy bought a palace that was actually unfinished. It never got to the second floor that was planned on it. So there's a beautiful terrace on top of the museum. And uh, at the entrance, you would get to go there anytime you wanted and just hang out. There are wonderful pictures of Peggy actually taking a, kind of doing a sunbat on the you know, you enjoying your palazzo all the way. It was a lovely flat roof. They often yes. have parties up there. They do. I've been privileged enough to be invited to some Yes, of them. yes, exactly, exactly. So um, there's definitely a different life in Venice where on the Grand Canal, or if you live in tiny uh, Calle uh, behind. Um, the Zatri is also a lovely place to Zatri, live. it is. You see the sunset on the Zatri. Yes, yes. And you're quite sheltered from the Bora. I'm north facing, so I the Bora hits our front windows mm -hmm. in the winter when it blows. And believe me, it does bore through you, the Bora. And from Zatari, you see Judeca, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. that's another beautiful you're facing the south the part of Venice. Uh, Lauren is asking, are you able to grow flowers in your patio garden? We try, but we, we don't get a lot of sun. So we, it's trial and error as to what can grow there. Roses and um, and I've also I've trained the jasmine up all the walls, which is lovely, uh, especially in May and ju early June. Yes, when yes. you come in at night, the smell of night jasmine. Yeah. Uh, talking about jasmine, do you have a favorite perfume? Mimi, you're a tra trendsetter here. <laughs> I do. I do. I'll have to go and get it. I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can. We can include that in the recording as well. Yes. Um, Marsh is asking, do you go to Tessiere uh, for dinner with Luca? Tessiere. I know. I know the place. Um, 
it's very hard to get into, as you know, it's a very small restaurant, most probably. <laughs> I'm, I tend to be last minute when I want to go somewhere to eat. We eat a lot at home because the market is so good that we don't eat in restaurants a lot. Yeah. Unless yeah. we're here with some friends who want to go out. Uh, we, tend to, we tend to eat at home. Actually, there was a question about your favorite uh, dish, uh, Anita. Okay, what is your favorite Venetian food or dish? Well, I love the seafood we can get here, all the different varieties of seafood that come from the lagoon. Yes. Um, I don't eat a lot of meat, as I said. Uh, and the fresh vegetables that are grown on Santarasmo, there's an island which is called Santarasmo, which is full of market gardens. And, uh, and so th th they bring them straight to the market. And, and so we eat a lot of um, vegetables because of that. Uh, do you enjoy uh, or partake in Carnivale or avoid the crowds? Uh, no, I love to see the, the efforts people make with costume. I tend not to dress myself in Carnivale unless I'm invited to a private party, which has happened in the past. Okay. You try. You trying to stay out. I, I'll go and look and see in San Marco. I love to see everybody dressed up. Yeah, it's a it's a quite a, a lifestyle. And I living in Florence for about fifteen years. I avoided coming to Venice for Carnivale because everyone said don't bother. Um, but actually, there is a way to avoid the big crowds. And uh, I got to meet a lot of people who come around the world. And uh, I realized that the yearly meetings in, in Carnivale times are going to become a way for them to mark the passage of time because yes. they raise their children and then the kids married. And so there's actually amazing friendship that's kind of started or created around the Carnivale that actually was only revived in 1980s. Mm -hmm. So it is not as old as we think uh, it was. Many thanks coming in, Mimi. Everyone is delighted to have met you. And uh, Thank you so much for your time. Maybe let's take two more questions if anyone wants to pop in. Late, and perhaps you answered this, but uh, how is it that you ended up living in Venice? What brought you to the city? Ah, oh, hello, Clara. Hi. What brought me to the city was that my husband had a Lana Ficho. He's always been in the wool business. And he had a Lana Ficho about an hour and a half from Venice, where we were originally living. And then he bought a wool combing plant near Padova, so, which is about 20, 30, 20 or 30 minutes from here, depending on traffic. So we, um, we moved then to Venice. Oh, okay. Lauren is asking a good question. How can people be good tourists in Venice? I think be considerate of the fact that people live here. Just be considerate. Also to walk always on the right-hand side of the car lane. Yeah, there is a rule here about walking on the right hand side of the if everyone walks on the right hand side of the Kali, uh, it work people can That's move around much more easily and not block the bridges. I think yeah. those are two very good pointers for, for visiting Venice. I learned that hard way in the 2000 when I was here. They said, a destra, a destra. They kept telling me to move to the right <laughs> because there's actually the, the flow and these very happens. narrow Kali's. It's, it's much easier if everyone stays on the right. Yes. Uh, I wish they would do that in Florence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Florence has its own set of rules, as we well know. To be. But do you, Mimi, do you think the world will go back as it was before the pandemic? Do you think we will have mass tourism again starting I next think year? I think we already do. Yes, judging by when it's today, what I saw coming in, yes. it was incredible. Since the autumn. Yes. You know, in May, we didn't have so many people here. And that was when we decided to, to, to announce we were doing this trip in October. Uh, and we weren't sure what October was going to bring. And so I think a lot of people didn't make plans to, to travel. But this autumn really has seen every weekend a lot of people in Venice. Yes, 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 yes. Maybe almost too many. October, after everything changed in Florence as well, yes. all of a sudden the world. Oh, yeah, completely full. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mimi, thank you so much for your time. Thank you everyone thank for tuning in. I've enjoyed it.